Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, th thank you so much for joining us. Uh, DOPS Practice Monitor uh, update for, for May of 2018, our uh, focus on emerging trends and some hot topics that, that we'll consider as well. And if we move to the next slide, thank you. All right, well, uh, my name is Bruce Robinson. I'm the principal investigator for the DOPS program. I'll give just a brief uh, introduction and then we'll move on to uh, Doug Fuller, who will speak on recent trends in U.S. dialysis care through the Doctor Practice Monitor. And following that, uh, Hugh Rayner, uh, uh, an investi country investigator with the DOPS program from the U.K., will focus on pruritus. Uh, this is an area that is re really very important to patients and likely under-recognized and under-treated under by, by, nephro by, by nephrologists uh, in the dialysis unit. And following uh, Hugh's discussion, Ron Pizzoni will spend about 20 minutes uh, uh, giving an update with respect to vascular access with a focus on a recent, very recent publication in AJKD, uh, but in addition, some, some other uh, relevant topics. Uh, thank you. And just to note, uh, as we get going, uh, a warm thanks to our, our study sponsors. The DOPS program would not be possible without the support for independent scientific research to improve patient care from the companies listed here. And uh, the DOPS is currently in over uh, 20, the DOPS program is currently in over 20 countries, and we do have specific country level support as noted also. We also have public funding support in six different countries as noted. And amongst our public funding support, just wanted to give a quick shout out for a new um, um, uh, grant that was recently awarded to the DOPS program. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which uh, here in the U.S., uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, recently awarded um, the, uh, the PDOPS study a grant to focus on prevention of peritonitis in PD patients, and as well, in addition to focusing on reasons for, um, for peritonitis and how to prevent it, but focuses as well on disseminate, knowledge dissemination, quality improvement initiatives as well to really um, understand variation in peritonitis and ultimately help make, an, make a difference and improve uh, the peritonitis uh, occurrences. And just a note as well, in addition to our um, Ron Bazzoni and, and Dr. Pearl, who's at Toronto leading the study, we have a, a very large group of st stakeholders as listed on this slide. The International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis, um, input through the ASN and through the, CD, through the CDC, as well as um, pediatric organizations uh, and others. So th this is a, a topic that we're really very excited and, and honored to, to begin work on. And we anticipate providing updates uh, on, on these, uh, um, on future WebExes uh, as well to, to, to the audience. Next, please. All right, well, we encourage you uh, uh, to, to tweet, uh, so anybody can tweet, and so feel free to do so. Uh, join, join the conversation on Twitter, Twitter. follow us uh, at Pops, uh, Study. Uh, thank you, next slide. And uh, for those of you who joined uh, these web conferences before, we, we, we tried to make them as interactive as can be, um, given that we're all uh, you know, uh, sitting down in remote locations. But we do encourage folks to submit questions uh, throughout the session, and we'll pause at various intervals to answer those. So please submit your questions using the chat with presenter feature uh, accessed at the bottom left corner of the screen. And in addition, uh, in the theme of, uh, of being interactive, um, we, we will have polling questions that, that are uh, presented to the audience uh, at, at various time points during the presentation. So. Um, when the poll is open and displays on your screen, please answer your question and don't forget to hit the submit button. And of course, please be assured that all responses will remain confidential. Next slide, please. And uh, with that, uh, after those brief introductory comments, uh, we'll move on to, to the first topic of interest. And Doug Fuller is a, a senior uh, research analyst uh, here with the DOPS program and uh, uh, really the, uh, an expert with the DOPS practice monitor data here in the U.S. Doug will provide an update on recent trends in, in U.S. care. Doug. Thanks, Bruce. The first slide here uh, just shows uh, a depiction of the DOPS practice monitor website accessible at www.dops.org slash DPM. Uh, we include a, a series of featured measures uh, 
those measures of uh, higher interest in the nephrology community, as well as uh, toward the bottom of the page, um, uh, the ability to browse all of the DPM data, uh, over 1,500 figures and tables uh, across a variety of different uh, classifications of facilities and patient characteristics and, uh, and clinical uh, topic areas. Uh, the DOPS practice monitor includes more than 200 facilities from the U.S., over 14,000 patients. Our data are sourced uh, from uh, the two uh, large LDOs and Visinex, uh, which is a provider of uh, EMR software primarily for small, uh, small chain independent and hospital-based units in the U.S. and, and elsewhere. Um, so the first slide uh, I'll discuss are the uptake of newer medications that we're uh, uh, have available to us in the DOPS and in the DOPS practice monitor. The first one is the uptake of iron-containing phosphate binders. And um, we first uh, started collecting this data in our uh, DOPS 6 sample, uh, which began in the middle of 2015 on the left side of the x-axis, and uh, has uh, steadily increased uh, almost threefold from 2.4 percent in June of 2015 up through 7% uh, at the beginning of 2018 on the right side. And this is uh, any use over the prior three months. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, uptake of Mercera, we've been reporting on this. Uh, Mercera was approved uh, several years ago as well, and uh, we've primarily seen this in the uh, large dialysis organization uh, sample. Uh, on the left side of the screen, uh, among the LDO and MDO combined sample, 44% uh, of patients are using the pegylated depotent beta uh, Mercera product. Um, of note, uh, on the left side, the small DOs and independents, uh, there has been a very stark transition uh, in those facilities from use of uh, epoetin, uh, either intravenous or subcutaneous epoetin alpha, uh, now 92% of those patients in those facilities are now using darbipoidin. Moving on to anemia, uh, with the introduction of uh, Mercera in 2000, I believe it was 2015, we've not actually seen uh, very much uh, variation in hemoglobin distributions. Uh, just to quickly orient you to uh, our DPM style box plots, the, the, the circles in the middle uh, represent the median of the distribution. The lower uh, error bars correspond to the 10th and 25th percentiles, and the upper error bars correspond to the 75th and 90th percentiles, respectively. And we see that over the last uh, three years, since February of 2015, that we've uh, not really had much of a trend in hemoglobin levels overall, uh, either at the median or in the various percentiles. Uh, the, the median hemoglobin that we uh, observe in February 2018 is 10.7 grams per deciliter. Prescription of anemia therapies uh, at any time during the prior three months, about 88% of patients uh, have received an ESA. 80% uh, of patients are, have received uh, intravenous iron. Interestingly, the proportion of patients receiving ESA uh, through the subcutaneous route has always remained fairly low uh, or absent in the LDO sample, but among the non-LDO sample, with that transition to darbipoetin that I mentioned earlier, uh, the proportion receiving sub-Q ESA, which had increased after the bundle uh, implementation in 2011 up to almost 40 percent, has now declined. Uh, very starkly down to under 10 percent in the last uh, year. Next slide. Uh, ferritin levels, uh, which had increased uh, after implementation of the bundle, uh, over the last three years now appear to have uh, perhaps leveled off with the, uh, the median ferritin ranging between 780 and, and about 800 nanograms per milliliter. Um, with uh, a range in the 10th and 90th percentile range from 275 up to 1,413. Um, we've also, during this time, we've also observed no uh, particular trend in uh, transfer and saturation values or TSAT values. Moving to mineral and bone disorder topics, uh, the distribution of PTH or parathyroid hormone 
Uh, we did observe and report an increase in PTH levels just prior to and, and during implementation of the bundle uh, in 2010 and 2011. Um, in the last three years, since uh, 2015, the median has not changed very much, uh, staying between 350 and 360. Um, however, the upper percentiles of the distribution uh, denoted by the orange line at the top, uh, the 90th percentile has continued to increase uh, even as the median has uh, flattened out. Um, so currently the 90th percentile is, is 1,000 picograms per ml with a median of 364. Prescription of MBD therapies, again, over the prior three months. Uh, in blue, we show uh, phosphate binder use has been slowly declining over the last few years. Now about 78% of patients received phosphate binder in the last three months. In the orange, uh, we have a uh, proportion of patients prescribed a vitamin D therapy. Uh, this includes IV and oral. And we previously reported about the, the uptake in oral calcitriol in the LDO facilities. That's now 40% of patients overall, with 54% of patients receiving IV. And uh, those of you who will note that that adds up to more than 83%, some patients are receiving both. Um, the trend in Sinecal said uh, continues to very gradually increase over the last three years and has now reached about 31% of patients overall. As I mentioned previously, the, uh, the transition to oral calcitriol in, in many of the LDO facilities um, now uh, presents a slide of uh, vitamin D type distribution that looks like this, where in the orange you have the oral calcitriol uh, and uh, that's about 35% of patients uh, using exclusively oral calcitriol uh, compared to 47% using IV doxycalciferol and 11% using IV paracalcitol. Um, the remaining 7% uh, include uh, any combination of things that are not exclusively one preparation or another. Lastly, looking at dialysis dose and prescription. Uh, the, the trend in, in dialysis treatment time has uh, very gradually been increasing from August of 2010, which is the, the earliest date available in the DOPS practice monitor. The mean treatment time has increased from 217 minutes per session to uh, 222 minutes per session, and that has uh, corresponded as well with a 5% decrease in the proportion of treatments that are less than three and a half hours or, or 210 minutes. Um, so uh, that uh, actually brings us to our first poll question. Uh, which, which of the following best describes uh, the, the trend in ultrafiltration rate available uh, among hemodialysis patients in your unit? And the options are increasing, no change, or decreasing. Okay, so we have the responses on the screen, and it looks like 43% uh, of you responded that UFR values are, dec are decreasing in your unit, about 36% with no change, and 21% and increasing. So uh, thank you for your responses, and uh, that's very interesting. So uh, with, the, um, with this uh, update of the DOPS practice monitor in April of this year, uh, we are now reporting uh, ultrafiltration rates. Um, what we see since the beginning of uh, the DOPS practice monitor in, in August of 2010, we see that the mean UFR rate reported uh, in our sample has declined from 9.3 down to 7.8 milliliters per kilogram per hour, and that represents uh, a, a quite substantial drop uh, of about 16% um, overall. And in particular, uh, the proportion of patients with a UFR for the session less, uh, sorry, 13 or higher, that's declined by 50% from 18 
down to 9% of patients. Um, I, I do also wish to point out that the, the QIP program will be introducing a reporting measure with the program year in 2020 that uh, will require the reporting of UFR values uh, for, for dialysis patients through Corona Web. And uh, with the uh, potential uh, future uh, consideration that there may be a, uh, a value-based uh, measure implemented sometime after that. Um, previous studies have indicated that UFR values greater than 13 may be associated with um, complications and, and comorbidities uh, of the dialysis session. Um, and uh, values of 10 to 13 uh, may also be a, a smaller but still slightly increased risk. So the next uh, poll question I have for you is, if the average UFR in your facility is declining, uh, which of the following causes best describes um, that decline? Uh, is the decline due to uh, improved management of water and salt intake, longer average treatment times in your unit, um, other practices to specifically preserve renal kidney function, uh, residual kidney function, sorry, or uh, some other practice? I'll give you a minute to respond to that. Okay, so uh, the responses look like uh, almost even uh, 32 and 38 percent responded with management of water and salt intake and longer average treatment times with 10 percent reporting uh, practices to preserve residual kidney function and 20 percent uh, reporting other. And I might also presume that some, some of you may have responded other to indicate some combination of the three. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's great to know. Um, the longer treatment times uh, are, are probably very beneficial to the dialysis patient. How to uh, reduce UFRs um, down to a level uh, 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 that would be considered uh, safe. So, in summary, um, the key, key messages: uh, the DARPA code in use in the SDOs, independent and hospital-based units. Um, is, is uh, greatly increased. 63% uh, of patients overall are using some form of long-acting ESA, whether that's Darbopoidin or uh, the Mercera. And that has driven a reduction in the percent of patients receiving their ESA through subcutaneous routes. Um, high PTH levels are still getting higher. Uh, we've uh, continued to report the proportion of patients with PTH above 600, which is uh, roughly the upper uh, limit recommended by the KDEGO guidelines. 33% uh, of patients, uh, black patients, uh, have PTH above 600 with 20% of non-black patients above 600. And uh, new to the DPN, this update, uh, reporting on the ongoing reductions in ultrafiltration rate uh, with 9% uh, of patients with uh, UFRs above 13. So. Um. So thank you. Um, we will move to some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature, and uh, we will try to capture those and respond to those. I had, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, Doug, uh, this is Bruce. Yeah, thanks so much for that review. It's very, very clear. I, I give me a share continued concern about the high ferritin levels. Again, much, much higher than than we see elsewhere uh, in other DOPS countries, and. Uh, in particular, as you highlighted, Doug, the rise in the, the high PTH levels, in, with including actually continuing rise in PTH levels, uh, uh, um, at least the proportion with high PTH. 
Um, and then also this really pretty extraordinary decline in ultrafiltration rate. It's really quite remarkable over time. The DOPS has a publication uh, in AJKD within the last year or so looking at trends in blood pressure, UF volume, and UF rate internationally, and we do show declines in all of those internationally, although the data that Doug is showing are more recent yet than that, so to see this decline is really impressive. It would seem to me, I mean, and though many of the folks uh, here on, on the phone, um, this, for you, in your unit, this may be in part because of increased treatment time. We still see, on average, quite short treatment times in the U.S. and not a dramatic rise overall. So it seems to me likely that there's, there, there must be some greater attention to, uh, um, to, to salt and water intake and, and uh, you know, nutritional counseling. So I, I, you know, whatever that might be, I really um, congratulate folks on, on the progress made there uh, as well. Okay, well, so moving on to our next topic. Um, uh, Hugh Rayner is, is, a, is a colleague of, uh, of ours, a nephrologist and uh, DOPS country investigator from Birmingham uh, in the UK, and has been really a great contributor to the DOPS, uh, both in the UK and internationally, um, um, since, since DOPS in the UK launched, which is uh, close to 20 years ago uh, now. Um, Hugh's also been a real proponent uh, over the years of, of listening to patients and uh, being sure that we, that we do our best to meet the needs of our patients, um, which may not always be exactly what um, um, us physicians and or other providers might, might tend to want to, but really listening and responding to patients. So with this in mind, pruritus is, I think, an important, very important topic, and uh, I'll pass the microphone over to Hugh. Uh, thanks so much. Hello. To confirm that. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. Carry on. Thank you very much. So, uh, if you want to follow up these slides later on, they are taken from a publication from C. Jason right at the end of last year, which you can see at the bottom of the slide there. And this is a, a slide that follows, in some ways, the DPM trend, which is looking at the prevalence of pruritus among hemodialysis patients. And all these slides are about hemodialysis patients over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And you can see there has been, again, improvement over time, particularly in those very much and extremely bothered by, by itching. That's gone down from 18% down, uh, 28 rather, percent to 18%. But there are still very many patients uh, that we look after who are troubled at least moderately by pruritus. And so it's an important topic to review. And the next slide, please. And we asked them in this paper what itching did uh, for them and how much of a problem it was, in what ways it was a problem. And these are standard questions that have been used in a number of surveys published in the past about this topic. And you can see how those patients who are uh, always bothered by itching, in other words, they score four to six, they're always bothered by itching in, in the last week, have very high intrusion of this symptom in their lifestyle. They're annoyed, frustrated about, about it, they're embarrassed about it, and actually constrains their uh, ability to work effectively and interact with other people. So it's a major social uh, problem for people. And the next slide shows how this is linked to other symptoms. Most patients with um, uh, itching also have dry skin, particularly if they're moderately or more bothered by it. And it also is linked to restless sleep, restless legs, but also insomnia and restless sleep. So that's a typical syndrome of somebody who's very troubled by itching. But it's easy for us just to talk about these things and show charts. I think better would be to go onto a video of a patient who I was looking after who describes what itching has done or was doing for her. And if you can play the video on the next slide, please. It was two years ago um, I started itching. When I itch, it's... Um it's so intense that you need to almost have nails on you to, to get any type of relief because um, it, it feels like phosphorus under your skin. Um, it's not on top of the skin, it's underneath. And as you scratch, it almost moves away um, and comes back as you stop scratching. I often scratch until I start making my skin bleed. Um, knowing that I'm scratching so badly, you can't stop yourself. The only way I get a bit of relief is by trying to cool the, the skin down, um, so under very cold water. I wake up at night, maybe once or twice, and scratch myself, um, which 
is obviously disruptive. Before that, uh, to get to sleep is even a problem. Um, because you get in and you need to scratch. So you never get to that quiet time to drop off to sleep. So what's been happening is that either my husband goes to bed at first and then I come to bed later. Um, but then I wake up at night and scratch, put the light on in the bathroom or um, which then disrupts him and he has to try and get back to sleep. I, I recognised signs in myself of becoming depressed. I, w I didn't want to do much during the day. I'd rather just sit and watch telly. And I, I stopped eating because I was becoming afraid of eating the wrong thing to make it worse because I, I was at the point where I didn't want it to get any worse because it was so bad. So in turn, I, I wasn't feeling, I didn't have enough energy during the day because I wasn't eating enough, which then impacts on the rest of the dialysis treatment because you then lose weight and your fluid content goes haywire. Um, so I knew that was becoming an issue. And, you know, on a bad day, you know, with being hormonal, you can think, well, I don't know how long I can deal with this. You know, is it going to be like this forever? And for uh, you know, a dialysis patient, it is forever. Okay, so for folks, uh, folks on the line, if you bear with us, just one moment. Uh, Hugh, can you s can you see the slides now? No, I'm sorry. Oh no. If should we we could. Uh, do the vascular access presentation, and then come back uh, for this right after that. Would that help? It would be fantastic. It would help. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thanks, Hugh. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hugh, thanks for your patience with this. Uh, and why don't we then, okay, we'll move on to Ron. Uh, Ron Zoni will lead uh, the, the discussion for about 20 minutes, um, focused on uh, vascular access, uh, uh, and in particular, a very recent publication of ours in, in AJKD. So Ron, uh, one of the senior research scientists uh, with the DOPS program. Okay. Thanks so much, Bruce. Yeah, so um, we, we thought you'd, uh, we'd like to pr pr um, just present results from our, our recent paper. But before doing that, then to um, uh, just show, um, start with some background from uh, one of our um, more recent um, uh, papers as well. Oh, and so if you could, yeah, we could go to the next slide. So this slide shows uh, uh, access use across countries in the DOPS, um, and this is from DOPS 5 from 2012 to 2014. And, and so we have fistula use in, in light blue, graft use in orange, and then catheter use in dark blue. And as you can see, uh, AV fistula use uh, varies greatly across countries, being 91 to 92% in Russia and Japan, 87% in China, uh, 80 to 83% in the UK and Germany and Turkey, and the US uh, and Italy at 68%. Um, and then there are a number of countries then uh, with a, a percentage below, uh, lower than that and with the lowest percentage seen in Canada at 49%. Uh, in Canada, there's a, um, quite a high use of catheters, which um, nephrologists there have, um, of, um, have, have been using uh, for, for quite some time. And um, so that's... Uh, um, quite common in practice in Canada. In about half of the countries, catheter use uh, currently is about 25 to 37 percent, and in the other half, generally about 10 to 15 percent, including the United States, where we have 15 percent catheter use, and then 2 percent in Japan. With regards to graft use, it, it typically ranges from about 4 to 10 percent uh, across all of the countries except the United States where we have 18% of patients uh, using a graft. And part of that will be explained in one of the following slides. If we could go on to the next one then. However, this slide shows the trend in vascular access use uh, during the last three years. And as you can see, it's been quite constant um, with about 66 to 68% of patients using a fistula, uh, 18 to 19% using a graft, and about 15% using a catheter. Then going on to the next slide, 
for the next few slides, we'll look at uh, access use in the U.S. Um, um, by different demographic characteristics. And here we see uh, access use by age group. And, and so we hear every now and then that, um, that it's difficult to place a fistula in older patients. However, here, even among patients who are 75 years of age and older, we still see that fistula use is nearly as high as it is in younger age groups. So it's 65% in the oldest age group, um, very similar uh, 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 use within those who are 55 to 64 years old, and then 68% among all the other patients. Uh, in terms of catheter use, it's a little higher in the older age group, and then graft use uh, uh, is the lowest in the youngest age group. Then going on to the next slide, here we look at access use by, um, in three different racial groups. And we see that fistula use is very similar among Hispanic and non-Hispanic white patients at about 70 to 74 percent, whereas fistula use is lower among black patients, but this is largely due to a twofold higher use of graft, uh, grafts among black patients at 26 percent uh, compared to 13 percent in non-black patients. And we've seen this consistently over the years uh, in DOPS, um, then going uh, in, in recent years, I should say. Uh, with regards to access use by, um, by race and sex, uh, here we see that among females that fistula use tends to be 10 to 15 percent lower uh, compared to males, and often that's due to um, a lower ves uh, smaller vessel size. And so we see that consistent pattern here both in, in, in black patients and in non-black patients. With regards to access placement, um, well, first of all, in the United States, about 80% of patients, of new patients, start hemodialysis with a catheter. So we are interested to know, among patients who have seen a nephrologist for at least four months, what percentage of patients um, had an AV fistula placed during the pre-SRD uh, period. And we see in the United States um, about 55% of patients had an AV fistula placed during the pre-SRD uh, period, uh, and 45% had not. Even though most of these patients had seen a nephrologist not only for at least four months before starting dialysis, but most of the patients have seen a nephrologist for at least six months to a year, uh, if not longer. Really, the practice is, is the highest in the UK, where, uh, uh, where Dr. Rayner practices, with 81% of patients, when they start dialysis, uh, having a fistula placed during the pre-SRD period if they've been seen for at least four months uh, prior to starting uh, uh, hemodialysis. Um, so now we'd like to go on with some of the more recent results then from our um, uh, uh, a uh, recent paper that looks at placement uh, of AV fistulae, uh, uh, whether they're placed in the lower arm or upper arm. Um, of those that are created, uh, what percentage of those are successfully used? And then time to first cannulation of, of newly created AV fistulae. And these findings uh, are based uh, uh, upon um, DOPS uh, data from DOPS 4 and 5 from 2009 to 2015 in, in the U.S., Japan, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. And um, with regards to successful uh, AV use, that was defined as using the AV fistula for at least 30 days after uh, first cannulation or after being cannulated. And uh, before uh, describing those results, though, we would just like to point out the, um, uh, the KDOKI vascular access guideline, um, which is really has recommended that, um, well, good surgical practice makes it obvious that when planning permanent access placement, one should always consider the most distal site possible to permit the maximum number of future possibilities for access. So. Um, uh, strongly recommending uh, placement uh, as distal as possible, but uh, of course in consideration of, of other um, um, uh, relevant aspects of, of the patient's condition as well. So this slide shows the uh, trend in a, um, arm location of uh, AVFs um, by region. This is from DOPS 1 through DOPS 5. 
and this is based on a, upon a prevalent cross-section of patients in each uh, country or each region within each phase. So um, it's a cross-section in time, uh, and then looking at which access the patient is using. If it was if it was an AV fistula, then was it placed in the lower arm or upper arm? And you see that in Japan, it's been consistently um, um, that 90 about 95 percent of all of the uh, of the AVFs in a prevalent cross-section are located in the lower arm, and about five percent in the upper arm. In uh, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, it, it used to be about 77%, and that's declined now down to about um, two-thirds uh, are, are located in the lower arm. Whereas in the United States, we've seen um, a strong shift uh, or trend over time, where in DOPS 1, about 70% of the AV fistulae were located in the lower arm, and now um, by DOPS 5, 32% uh, uh, are located in the lower arm. Uh, however, fistula use has greatly increased in the United States over this time period, um, from 24% in DOPS 1 to about 68% now in DOPS 5. And part of this as well could be a result of, um, of the great um, efforts and, and emphasis on creating um, an AV fistula in the United States, which has um, helped to achieve um, that great um, uh, uh, improvement in fistula use uh, in the United States. And, and so part of this as well may be um, uh, related to um, that effort to um, increase uh, use of AV fistula and, and it's easy. Um, easier to create a, a successful AVF uh, in the upper arm, at least in the United States. Um, if we go on to the next slide then, this uh, slide looks uh, across facilities within each region, uh, the percent of AVFs, of newly created a AVFs that are, are in the lower arm, and I'm just, uh, we've sh highlighted the United States here for patients of vintage less than two years and then compared to all patients with a newly created AVF, and the distribution is quite uh, is similar in both scenarios, but even for relatively new patients, that in some facilities, only about 10% of those AVFs are created in the lower arm. Uh, the median is about 32 to 35%, uh, which is the, the solid bar in the middle, and at the upper uh, 95th percent, about 70% in, in some facilities, 70% of, of AVFs are, are placed in the lower arm. But again, in most facilities, it, it ranges between about 20 to 50% if we look at the 25th to 75th percentile. Uh, if we look at the next slide, and, and this is um, eight percent of AVFs placed in the lower arm by age group, and this is just shown for males, though we see a similar trend for females, um, that it just declines a little bit um, with age as you can see in all three regions. But in the United States, even for uh, young, the youngest group here, uh, males are less than 55 years of age um, uh, in AVFs that are placed, um, uh, only 36% are placed in the lower arm, and so uh, nearly two-thirds are placed in the upper arm. You go on then. Uh, and then I think we'll just go beyond this one as well since the pattern is so similar. When we've, uh, when we've looked at, at uh, models, multivariate models, um, with regards to the relationship between characteristics and uh, placement location, in the United States we see that patients are more likely to have an AVF placed in the, up, in the lower arm if the patients are male or, um, and less likely if they have peripheral vascular disease or have been on dialysis for a longer, uh, uh, longer period of time. I must uh, say that um, many of the other characteristics, however, there's, there has not been seen a very strong relationship for many of the comorbidities. Uh, okay, the next slide. Uh, this slide shows um, of newly uh, placed AVFs, uh, a percent of those that are successfully used, and it shows it uh, for lower arms uh, uh, compared to upper arms in the three different regions. So in the United States, for AVFs that are placed in the lower arm, about 56% of those are successfully used for at least 30 days. And uh, for those placed in the upper arm, 67% are successfully used. 
we see a similar percentage uh, in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, though not much of a difference between lower arm and upper arm. And in Japan, where the great majority are placed in the lower arm, uh, successful use is, is close to 90% at 88%. Next slide, please. And when we've also um, uh, carried out some uh, multivariate um, uh, Cox regression models, looking at the relationship between characteristics patient characteristics and successful use of, an, of a newly created AV fistula. In the United States, for these characteristics that are shown, there were only two that were strongly related, and that was a, a greater success rate among males compared to females, and a greater success rate um, uh, for those placed in the upper arm versus the lower arm. However, we should say that in Japan, in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, the uh, upper arm location was not associated uh, with, with higher use. Uh, we did see that here in the United States, but we did not see that in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and in Japan. Um, with regards to how long um, after creating uh, a fistula, then it's uh, uh, first successfully used. And that greatly differs across regions, so it's really the time to first cannulation, uh, so time to first successful use. And in Japan, uh, the median time is 10 days. So uh, in Japan, uh, AV fistulae are used very soon after being created. Part of that may be because um, the else in Japan, a, a lower blood flow rate of about 200 mils per minute are typically used for most patients once on dialysis and likely a bit lower than that, you know, when newly starting. In Europe, Australia, New Zealand, the, the median time is about 45 days uh, to first use of, a, of, a, of an AV fistula. And in the United States, the median time is about 85 days, and mean time is, is about uh, close to 100 days. And actually, these results are not that different from a, a paper that Dr. Rayner had led in 2003 when we looked at this uh, in, DOPS, uh, in DOPS with DOPS1 data. And these distributions actually are quite similar to that, to that paper led by Hugh uh, uh, back then. So then in summary, um, there's large variability seen across international regions in fistula use, uh, location of, of, of a fistula, uh, and successful use of, of a newly created fistula, and time to first successful um, use uh, in terms of the cannulation time. So really uh, across these four different measures uh, of um, uh, uh, important measures really officially use really large differences across regions. Also the time until becoming catheter free differs considerably between Japan, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And lower arm AVF placement is much less common in the U.S at 32% uh, compared to um, um, uh, 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 AVFs uh, created for patients in, in Europe and Japan. And, and this is true in the United States even for younger patients and, and for patients uh, who are relatively new to dialysis. Uh, and the large U.S. shift from lower to upper arm AVFs during the last two years uh, or decades uh, raises concerns regarding the long-term implications for HD patients. Uh, we have concerns that this may place some patients at greater risk of exhausting available sites for future AVFs and uh, greater potential adverse long-term effects of an upper arm AVF, uh, such as higher frequency of steel syndrome um, and um, central vein stenosis, higher AVF blood flow effects uh, on cardiac function. Um, so I think uh, we'll leave it at that, and um, and then we'll actually. Uh, this was just an additional slide that was put in there, uh, that was just a pass by, and then I think we'll return to Hugh's presentation. Is is that right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, right, uh, Hugh and, and audience, thanks so much for for accommodating the technical issues. Ron, thanks for your talk, and we have a couple uh, questions. In the interest of time, we'll answer offline. Uh, we'll respond uh, offline to folks. And uh, Hugh. Okay, so I hope you can hear me all right now. Uh, I apologize for the transatlantic yes. problems. Um, the next slide shows how um, the problem of pruritus is underestimated by medical directors who are interviewed in the facilities. And you can see that 
uh, in those facilities, most facilities have at least 5% of patients affected by itch, itchy skin, very much so, or extremely bothered. But the majority of the doctors in those units thought that fewer than 5% of their patients were affected. So there's a considerable underestimation of how common itching is. And the reason for that is probably that patients aren't being asked routinely, so they don't tell the doctors, and uh, the doctors don't prompt the patients uh, uh, to, to, to tell them about their symptoms uh, frequently enough. The next slide, please. And then we asked the doctors what they did about pruritus and ranked uh, an option, five different options for treatment of pruritus. And the most common um, um, priority for doctors was phosphorus control, phosphate control in those patients with high phosphate. 60% said they do that as the most important thing. And the biggest uh, group for, uh, of the least important was the use of prescription medications, so actual drug treatment. And the others fell somewhat in between. Quite a few people thinking that uh, dialysis dose was important and PTH was important. But phosphate control was by far and away seen as the most important thing to do. If you go on to the next slide, please. But we found absolutely no association of itching with phosphate levels, phosphorus levels. There was no association at all. And um, this is an update on the paper that Ron Pisoni wrote uh, a few years ago now, which did show an association, although it didn't explain the whole um, um, differences in severity of pruritus, but that's now gone. And there's no association with phosphate levels. And in the next slide, there's no association with calcium. On the next slide, please. Uh, with calcium or calcium phosphate product. Uh, there's no association with that. And similarly, there's no association with single pool KT over V, which is higher than it was. There is a, a small association, weak association, uh, significant but not particularly strong with albumin and CRP, so that patients who are extremely uh, bothered by itching in the past four weeks are, uh, seem to be more inflamed and the mechanism of that isn't clear, and that some people have found that in previous studies. But the idea that phosphate is the problem is no longer the case, it seems. Go on to the next slide. Uh, this highlights this issue I mentioned earlier, why doctors underestimate the problem. And we found that even patients who are nearly always or always bothered by itchy skin in the last week or two, 17% of those hadn't reported these symptoms. Either they didn't realize it was important or they didn't think anything could be done about it or didn't link it to their kidney disease. And 18% of these patients hadn't used any treatment for their itchy skin. So an extraordinary lack of um, intervention going on here. And a bit of background on the next slide about the pathways for itch. We talk about people receiving antihistamines as the commonly used drug prescription for this. But actually, there are two pathways that mediate itch in the nervous system. There's the histamine pathway, which is B, the lower left-hand column uh, uh, panel. And there's another one that you've probably never heard of. I certainly hadn't heard about this, uh, uh, which is stimulated by a cowage, which are these needles up on the right-hand side that come from a seed pod. And that's mediated by another pathway. And if you look at a very interesting paper in the next slide, uh, looking at hemodialysis patients who itch, and studying their brains with functional MRI scans, um, you'll see that the histamine responses were normal. When they were stimulated with histamine, their brain responses were normal. But if you look at the cowage pathway, they show very abnormal patterns of brain activity. And that, I think, explains why antihistamines don't work for uremic pruritus, even though 57% of medical directors use it as first-line treatment. They just don't work for severe pruritus and you have to use something else. And the something else is shown in the next slide, and that's gabapentin. This is a study now, it's over, uh, it's, you know, to, over 10 years old, 2004. When I first had my, my first experience of this, I thought this was too good to be true. Dramatic reduction in itch after using gabapentin. But I won't show you the video because I'm sure it'll crash my computer. But there's a, there's a partner video of that lady who you saw describing what it was like after she took her first dose of gabapentin. It is a, can have a dramatic effect after just the first dose. And this has now been replicated by many other people um, looking at um, the use of gabapentin. Uh, I would caution on the dose. This early study used quite a high dose. Uh, if patients don't tolerate gabapentin, the next slide shows an alternative you can use, which is pregabalin, and this is a randomized controlled trial 
uh, placebo controlled, uh, also on densitron control, which seems to be like a placebo, where pregabalin caused exactly the same improvement. And what's interesting is they measured sleep quality and quality of life scores, and they statistically significantly improved as well. So there are not many pills you can give people that actually improve your quality of life, and this is one of them. And the next slide shows our personal experience in our unit. Uh, I used, uh, started using this a few years ago now, and I've had many more patients since then, but we thought it was time to write it up when we got to 71 patients, of whom 40 were on hemodialysis. We used a much more cautious dose, 100 milligrams after dialysis, so three times a week, uh, and increasing as needed. And if that wasn't tolerated, we used 25 milligrams of pregabalin. And by using a combination of those two, um, we got 85% of patients free of their itching, pretty much. Um, and it's a very satisfying thing to do. So the next poll question is on the next slide. I'd be very interested to know if you have used gabapentin, whether you find it easy to use and how well tolerated it is. If you could check the relevant box on that, I'd be very interested to see the responses. So uh, results are in, and 71% uh, of you guys have never tried gabapentin. Well, there you go. Um, it's something that you can take away and try. So ask all your dialysis patients and your PD patients. It's actually more common in PD. And your CKD stage 4 and 5 patients, and you'll start using it because you'll find those. Uh, and, and you're not alone. You can see that, uh, that the majority of nephrologists we asked in this study never used gabapentin. The country that uses it the most is Germany, and they interestingly have produced a lot of guidelines about gabapentin use. Um, uh, and so to summarize, um, itching is still a problem, although it is getting better. Most nephrologists don't realize how common it is, and probably because they don't ask enough. Um, most of the things that nephrologists think are right aren't backed up by evidence, particularly phosphate control and histamine, antihistamine use, and a lot of patients aren't being treated who would benefit from treatment. And the next slide is the last one. A lot of variation across the world, but the majority of nephrologists don't use drugs that work, and we could do much better by patients. And I'm sorry about the technology, but we got there in the end. Indeed. Uh, Hugh, thank you so much, and uh, thanks. We were actually just on time at the top of the hour. I'd just like to note, uh, if, if folks want to re-listen to the WebEx uh, or share slides, uh, we have a, a link uh, that's shown here and can also be accessed from the DOPS Practice Monitor website. Our next update to the U U.S. DOPS Practice Monitor will be in six months uh, in October, just before the ASN, and we'll have a WebEx uh, at that time as well. Um, we have responded to a number of questions uh, offline and will continue to do so. But uh, anyway, so th thank you to all participants for joining us today um, and to our speakers as well. And have a great uh, evening. Thank you.